Hey everyone, welcome to the Beyond Extent podcast, a podcast dedicated to a chat between two environment artists discussing everything about the industry we work in. I'm Timothy and I'm joined by William, who is a friend and fellow colleague of mine. In this episode of the podcast, we're going to go back to basics and talk about our own jobs. We will be diving into the different aspects of our jobs, seniority levels and more. This episode was long overdue, so I hope you all enjoy it. Hi William, welcome back to the podcast on episode 11 and also Ooh. welcome back everyone who's listening. Yeah, welcome back guys. Thanks you... for tuning in. Oh yeah. How are you doing man? I know that I ask this every week but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's always the same answer. I'm, I'm good <laughs> but I'm just a little bit tired, you know? How about Yo. you? I'm doing good man. Like uh, I've been having fun um, working on my personal work recently. Like uh, stuff is really... Uh, getting some traction now that like all the other stuff is finding like uh, a certain rhythm so it's uh it's coming along nicely sounds good man awesome oh yeah so how do you feel about just talking about our jobs for this podcast episode this again (laughs) (laughs) yeah of course man i mean uh i uh, i think it makes a lot of sense to talk about what we what we do all day right yeah, because we we have like, well, this is the 11th episode and we haven't even talked about what we do on a daily basis or what, what just in like general terms is it, what what it's, what it's meant to be to be an environment artist. Right. So uh, it feels like there should be like episode one or two, but hey, here we are. <laughs> exactly. It's, uh, you know, better late than never. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. To hit that off, we're just going to talk about like what does it actually mean to be an environment artist? Because a lot of people think that it's just you taking control of the entire environment and then just building it, which is like the 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 initial idea that I had for the job as well. Um, but it's way more granular than that because it gets split up into like different categories. Yeah. So. Technically, me and Will were both environment prop artists. Yeah, but we've got the same job description. Yeah, exactly. So, but but here's the split. Like, I focus more on the levels themselves. Whereas, um, yeah, if you want, if you would just want to go ahead and tell us what you focus on, Will. Yeah. So I actually started off uh, also focusing on, on on level art, kind of like you, but I transitioned. Back, because that's what I what I used to do at um, at the at my previous job, is uh, doing more props and um, and uh, or asset creation, whatever you want to call it, right? Mm-hmm. So I kind of transitioned back into doing more of that, just because um, I really like doing it. I really, it's. I mean, I also like doing level art, um, but I think I would say there's probably people that um, that it comes more natural to to do level art. And um, for me, it's just the most natural thing for me is just making props. I don't know. I just, and I think that's what I'm like, that's what I'm best at as well. It's, I think my, my strengths are in just making a nice quick high poly. And uh, even though I like stuff like um, environmental storytelling, you know, some set dressing, all that stuff. It's, I don't think it's like my favorite thing to do. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but that's the cool thing, right? That in, in a lot of jobs, um, or at least in our job, we have the possibility to kind of do what we want to and transition into a role that fits us best. Yeah, yeah. And that's really cool. Yeah, it's also something that, that happens naturally over time as you as you find your passion and you delve more into the stuff that you want to do. Yeah. And you explore the stuff that you don't really know if you want to do it or not and then uh find out if you want to do it um so yeah that that led you to to focus more on the props themselves where from from my side i love to focus on like the the level art like the composition of the spaces like Hmm. creating interesting spaces for for the player to walk through and yeah, so so this is where like one of the splits happened that is really obvious within our studio where we have like uh 
a, a lot of people are focused more on level art, and then we have a couple of people making making the props themselves. But there are there are more the divisions in environment art itself. Like I've I've heard from from other companies that they have people that work on purely natural assets, for instance. They only yeah. do like um, foliage or rocks or whatever you want to call it, like the the, the plants. The, yeah, yeah, the more natural mm. environments, basically. And then you have the the other side of it, which is like the the opposite. What you just talked about, where you focus more on the man-made aspects, which would be like the more traditional prop artist route. Yeah, and and I would say even stuff like. Um like a hard surface artist still mm. belongs kind of into an environment artist thing right i mean it can it can go into vehicle artist which is arguably more of a character thing right so it's it it, it, it definitely the it, it becomes a little bit muddled like you can't really tell at some point what is it like for example if i'm i don't know like making a gun mm -hmm. are you an environment artist are you more of an environment artist or more are you more of a character artist or are you weapons artist you know which i think by now is definitely a separate thing yeah but um it could be it kind it could kind of be either because uh especially in a first person game right your your gun is kind of your character so mm -hmm. it's 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 a weird it's a weird distinction but um yeah there's a lot of like you said granular granularities to to it and you can you can break it up into different uh disciplines yeah for sure and it also it also highly depends on the studio that you're working for too, because yes. some studios like to call different things by different names. Where, um, like a really simple example is like uh, a junior or an associate, which is like the more right. used term in uh, America. That's like a really simple example, like uh, detached from from what we're talking about. Yeah, um, and. Um... One of the level designers at our studio told me about uh, that he worked. He used to work in a studio where uh, the level designers would actually also do all the level art, and then the artists were simply making props and making uh, like make making the the assets for the environment. And then oh, okay, yeah, all the level art would be handled by by level designers as well, which is seems. I don't know if it's the best idea, but um, it, it was like he was working on games where I guess there was not like that much of a incentive. Like there was, it, it wasn't as important as it might be in different games. Yeah, it, it kind of depends on the game as well, right? So yeah. for for like a, a tactical based shooter where like the level design is really important, it might be might be really good that just the level design focuses on addressing the level because right. there is so much overlap between level art um like an environment artist and a level designer too yeah yeah i mean that's 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 the thing right it's there's no clear cutoff point usually mm -hmm. i mean of course you can say well if this person starts doing this as well then maybe they're not an artist anymore they're doing more of a level design thing yeah but it's really hard to say what exactly you are and i think that's why that's why right away when you get hired they don't tell you you're going to be a prop artist or you're going to be an environment artist they're mm -hmm. gonna say you're gonna be an environment and prop artist because whatever the needs may be, they can, you know, like they know that you, they can use you for that. They can, they can, they they have someone to, to fill to that need. That. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, how would you describe to students the the exact role of an environment artist, if you want to make it really clear? Hmm. Like how can we how can we make it really clear that these are like the the splits within environment art? I would say if we want to keep it really high level, you you have the stuff that we just talked about, where it's like you have props on one side and then you have just the the level art side of it, right? And then if you want to break it into more specifics, on the prop side you have weapons, vehicles, uh, hero props, just normal props. Uh, and then on the level art side, you would have um, more specific focuses like just level art itself or foliage. Um, what else could there be? On the level art side? On the level art side, yeah. If we're looking at the 
the environment art spectrum? Well, I would say that you're doing like level art is mostly like just set dressing a lot of the time, but you have you can also have stuff like terrain sculpting. Oh yeah, know, that's good. Yeah. That that kind of stuff depending on what kind of game you're working on. Um and the thing is I would say that maybe there's less granularity in the level art, but there's a lot more communication in it, right? Because mm -hmm. if you're working on level art, uh, which is something I learned um uh when I when I started, like I said I was doing more level art then, is yeah. There's, there's just, of, of course you have to talk to your, to, to the other artists, but you also have to talk to, uh, yeah, to level designers, obviously, technical people like tech, tech artists, mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that. Um, narrative and the, yeah, too. narrative as well. Yeah. So yes, you have to take care of a lot of stuff, and it's, it's really fun. I, I uh, that part of it, I really like. Um, even though I thought, because I, at first I thought I might not, because I really love just putting my headphones on and then just making making a prop for a day and then you know mm -hmm. just doing doing it on my own but it's that that was really cool because you you also learn a lot from other disciplines right and then you you know the next time you're doing something you already know hey i'm not going to do it like this because then the level designer is going to be angry with me so yeah, i'm just going to yeah. do it that way from the start right so it's it's definitely um more collaborative but um it's more yeah I, I couldn't break it down as much as i could props maybe i would say right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah but that's a good way of looking at it like um if you look on the level art side you have the terrain sculpting the the set dressing itself of locations and then in some studios you might also be involved with just the the setting up of the space like the the, the more conceptual part yeah and and um like modular sets and stuff like that i would mm -hmm. say i wouldn't put it in like the props category right so if you're making like a like trim sheets and, and modular kits for houses mm -hmm. it's it's something that might might belong more into the level like i would say maybe level artists would that would be something that they would do in terms of modeling yeah yeah right oh but well, another thing we haven't talked about is uh, materials that's another part of yeah. being an environment artist is some people just uh, sit in Substance Designer or in, in ZBrush or wherever all day and make cool materials for the rest of us to use, right? Yeah. Well, this is this is so weird, right? Because we don't really get to do that. Right. Because I, I come from a, a job where I used to do that. I was uh, responsible for, like you said, like creating a modular kit. And I was also responsible for creating the materials for it too. Right. So... I was basically the owner of that entire kit and to make it look good was just my sole responsibility where right right now it feels like you said way more involved like I'm talking to to a lot of other people getting a lot of feedback from different disciplines as well from narrative from concept from uh art direction like there's it's it's way more involved but um when when talking purely about materials um I would say that a lot of the big companies already have such a massive library of materials anyway, created by a dedicated team, mm. um, that you as an environment artist don't get to touch it as much. Right. Because but I think at, I think as a, like under the umbrella of an environment artist, that's mm -hmm. that's one one thing of it. Even though there is like a specific like. It's it's not you're you're not going to be doing s some material some of the time you're either going to be doing them all the time or not at all I would say most you know what I mean yeah like yeah you're yeah. going to be the dedicated guy but I would still put it under the umbrella of environment artist yeah yeah for sure for sure so I would say that that may be a completely different like third thing mm -hmm. like you have props you have uh, level art you have materials maybe I don't know but yeah that's like if if you if we had to break it down to to a student, like you said, right? I would say an environment artist is the person who takes care of making the the playable space look good. Yeah, and it's it's. I think it's really important to say look good because that's what we do. We don't we don't create the playable space. We're not the people thinking like, oh, there's gonna be a gate over there and a thing over there. Because that's what concept, like if if you if if you're in a bigger team, concept people are gonna do that. 
mm-hmm. and uh, and you do you're not like oh there's going to be a thing over here and then over there because level design is going to take care of that. Yeah, of course, exactly. if you're in a in a smaller team or if you're working on personal work, it's different because then you have to do all of this stuff mm-hmm. but, uh, in a big studio, let's just say. So essentially, what you're doing is you're taking the ideas from concept with the uh, with the backstory that narrative came up with. You take the the block out that level design made that works with uh, with your gameplay, and then you pretty much just put makeup on it and make it look nice, right? Yeah. And That's you and you try to create like the the lo- uh, location that feels good and that yeah feels like it could be like a real location where before it's just a block out the space doesn't have an identity yet and you're exactly. there to put that identity like you said like using using the the bricks that narrative and concept provide and you just build the entire thing basically right yeah that could yeah, be a that's... good way of uh, saying it. Yeah, because that's that's I think it's really important because sometimes people think, I mean, uh, it's like I th- I I uh, I know we're talking to people that have some you know some knowledge in this, uh, at least, but when I talk to people that don't know anything about um, this kind of stuff, mm-hmm. then it's 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 a lot of the time it, it can be really hard because uh, people are like, oh, you're a programmer, well, no, not really, uh, oh, you're a game designer, uh, almost. And then, oh, so you design the levels? And I'm like, yeah, close enough, right? <laughs> but um, but that's the thing. That's why I explicitly say we make it look good because we don't we don't create the world itself. We just take the 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 blocky gray world that someone else created and we we make it look nice. Yeah, yeah. And we make it look nice by either creating materials. T- making making props or taking those props and scattering them, them around the world, right? Mm-hmm. That's kind of yeah, yeah. That's basically how I started out in the industry. Like before before I joined the studio, mm-hmm. I didn't have an idea of what it truly meant to be an environment artist because yeah. I was doing my personal work and I was responsible for everything. Like I was uh, also responsible for VFX, which is something that we didn't really talk about, um, but like. The effects, materials, the block out itself, like the composition, everything I was responsible for in my personal work. And right. then you you get into your first job and then you realize that a lot of the things that you spend time on are not really your responsibility anymore. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, that's the big thing with the materials, right? Yeah. Because exactly. if you work on your own stuff, you don't have a huge library of uh, pre-made materials. But if you work on a big, uh, big game, they're not gonna make, like they they're not gonna remake all of the stuff all the time. They they just have a big library of them, right? Mm-hmm. At least with a lot of the studios. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then that's that's another restriction that is put up on you, right? Like, uh, you have to kind of know what is available, kind of know what you can use in the context mm. of your environment that you're trying to build and kind of use those restrictions and be creative with them too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That, that's actually one of the things that really uh, that I really like about making games is that restriction part of it. Mm-hmm. So of course, these, like, these restrictions can be super uh, frustrating at some point where you're like, I just want to make this look nice. Like, why can't you just let me do this or this? And they're like, oh, no, don't work. Um, either because of limitations of an engine or a budget or some other reason. Yeah. Um, but it's that's what kind of makes it fun for me at the same time. Because if I were work, working on, on movies, which I, I'm sure have their own restriction. Uh, I've never done uh, CGI for a movie, so I'm, I don't have any idea what I'm talking about is what I'm saying. <laughs> so... Um, I assume that there's also some kind of limitation, but at at least like budget wise, um, like uh, poly budget wise and texture size, uh, yeah, yeah, wise, everything gets rendered to an image anyway, so there is exactly. no real restriction when it comes to that. Yeah, so you can kind of go crazy, but I like that. I like having normal maps and faking stuff. You know, <laughs> like making. I I like making stuff look good, even though I know that it's like it's it's bare bones right like yeah. it's just got this it's just got this but it still looks good that's that's what really excites me about game art 
Yeah, I agree. Like there, there is some sort of pride that comes into it too, right? Like yeah. even even if the consumer doesn't know it, like right. we we as artists were like, look, we had to work with this engine, we had to work with these tools, and this is something that was never done before to this right. degree, but we still managed to pull it off. Yeah. Even though we made some uh, technical artists cry, I'm sorry, technical artists, <laughs> but. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Like, uh, it really makes me think about all the all the moments where, uh, as an artist, like I would have this idea and be like super excited about building it. Yeah. And then being like, oh, but then this restriction, I don't know if we can make it work. And then this other restriction, hmm, maybe that's not gonna work too. But that's where the collaboration part comes in, right? Because then it's like, okay, I don't know what these restrictions mean accurately. So let me talk to a technical artist. Or maybe I can give my idea to like a concept artist and they can do something even more cool than right. I have in my mind. And they can put it on paper and help you maybe pitch the thing. Be like, look, this is the idea that I had. This is sketched by the concept artist here. And this is how I imagine it looking. Yeah. There's, there's, yeah, that's a really good point. Like the collaboration part of it is is so nice. Yeah. No, it's it's that that is true. I think. Yeah. By the way, I just go yeah. ahead. No, I, I just wanted to say I, I just realized that uh, even though I'm saying I love the restrictions and it makes me really motivated to do stuff, that um, my last person or one of my last personal projects was um, was a gun and I put two 8K texture sets on it. So. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't exactly say that that's that's a lot of restriction, but you know. Uh, <laughs> but that that's personal work. We can ignore that, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, that's that. That was just me, you know, bathing in the glory of uh, of of high textile density. For I think I think sometimes you need that though. Sometimes you need to be like, look, I'm not going to worry about the technical part, and I'm just going to have fun with this. Oh, I think I showed you the wireframe of my Tokyo scene, right? I don't think he did. Oh man, Woo -hoo. we that should we should put this be... on on the screen right now. <laughs> oh no, please don't. <laughs> uh, well, because the thing is, I just put edges everywhere because I uh, I use a lot of vertex paint. Mm -hmm. So uh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just fucking it's tessellated all over the place. It looks great. <laughs> and there's there's like because I'm I'm making a stylized uh, Tokyo scene. I don't know if I've really talked about this on the podcast before. Um, I think you did in the beginning, yeah. Yeah, I might, I might have, yeah. And um, there's like all these wires, all these cables hanging from the poles, right? Because that's like one of the key visual aspects of like a Tokyo street. Mm -hmm. um, and there's like these cables that are like swirl. They're like, they're like a rope, right? They like uh, go around each other. Mm -hmm. And and I baked them down, but I still like gave them a little bit of thickness and and. Um, <laughs> And variation, so you have like the silhouette of like the the twisting cables around mm -hmm. each other. It's it might be a bit overkill, but that's a, that's the thing. I'm first of all, I, I I'm limiting myself in the way of like uh, making stylized stuff. So it's 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 already going into like a different direction. But what I think is really important as well about stylized stuff is then having having interesting silhouettes and yeah, having yeah, yeah. A, everything be like super straight. And um, and yeah, that that's actually an important thing I think to to think about as well. Um, is what does your portfolio already show? And in my case, it's I already have some stuff from like previous jobs up there. Mm -hmm. So people like if a recruiter were, I mean, I that's the other thing. I'm not like I'm not like a guy in uni who needs to find a job right away, right? I've I've got one and I'm happy. So. Um, if a recruiter were to look at my my stuff, they would see, okay, he worked on those games before, so he probably knows how to optimize something for a game. Yeah. Which means I can kind of go crazy in my in my personal work, right? I'm just trying to make it look nice. Yeah, and you don't have anything to prove anymore at this point. Because Exactly, like, yeah. The, the hardest thing to get into is just to get into the industry, right? Yeah, yeah. Get your foot in the door. That's the, that's the big one. Yeah, yeah. So how would that tie into um, your job as an environment artist? Because I, I do think that's a good point. Like uh, you basically create your own job 
by focusing on the things that you love to do, especially as a student or like as a person trying to get into the industry, like the, the art that you create is probably the job that they're going to hire you for. Yes. So if you like if you look at the at the umbrella that we talked about for like in environment art, like mm -hmm. pick something within that umbrella, try it out. And if it doesn't work, maybe pick something else and try to focus on materials for I don't know, a couple a couple of weeks, maybe months, depends on the time that you have, right? Right. But yeah, especially as someone trying to get into the industry, um really try to experiment in the beginning and try to get like a good solid job that you kind of know that you love to do from the get go. Right. That doesn't mean that you can't pivot when you're inside of a studio. There's still like plenty of options to do that. Um, you can you can still grow organically within like a new role, but and yeah, go ahead. And um, you don't have to be tied to one either. Like that's what I that's what yep. I told my manager was like, I really like doing props and stuff. That's like my I would say that's my number one passion. Mm -hmm. But I I've really enjoyed having more of a, um, a collaborative role with like level designers and and doing more more of that stuff. So why don't but well, like. I can have a balance of that as well. I can be like doing this then, and then if I'm needed for that, I can switch over to this. You know, it, it's it's it doesn't have to be black and white all the time. Mm -hmm. Of course, it it can make sense to focus on one thing more, and I think we wanted to speak about that later anyway. Um, but um, if if that's what you want, maybe like a hybrid role is something that's that's more for you, right? Yeah, exactly. Like it's it's important to speak up about that stuff. Like you said, like if if you don't tell your manager or um, really? if you're if you're in like a, uh, an interview setting, if you don't tell them that you really love to do this, even though your portfolio might show something different, that can still impact uh, your role within that studio. You just have to be yeah. really open about it. This might also be like a good opportunity to look at the the different. Um, how would you call them ranks of like junior intermediate and senior and like what the what the difference is in responsibilities because i think a hmm. lot of people get confused about that stuff too right so obviously you get into the industry as a junior and or an intern or, or an intern. intern yeah that's also a good thing like uh, I, I started as an intern myself i would I would say that my responsibilities as an intern were, were roughly the same as a junior, though. I don't know if you agree. Um, I've so I've never been an intern at a bigger company. I've just done like a little internship. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. In Lima, yeah. But I, I like the the my first real job. I would say I didn't start as an intern, so I I couldn't tell you what the difference was there. Mm -hmm. But I think a friend of mine there was an intern, and he pretty much did the same thing that I did. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I think your responsibility is doing stuff, but mostly learning stuff is yeah. what that's what you're there for. Yeah, it's it's like you're still going to get jobs from the people above you, right? Like from from the senior or the lead in most cases where right. they have ownership over the entire thing that you're building and yeah. they have the responsibility of managing the people underneath them. So mm -hmm. they divide up the tasks and then split them around in the team most of the time. Obviously, it's not like a it's not like a black and white thing. Like you, as a team, you're you're talking about the stuff that you want to work on, and you have you have a choice. It's not like they only give stuff to you, and that's the only thing that you have to do. Right. Uh, obviously, we have the additional factor of like um, some some other. Studios working in a different way too, but generally, I would say that that is the way of working. So then, a junior doesn't have big, big responsibilities yet. He's learning a lot. He or she is learning a lot of stuff, and yeah, it's just getting getting used to the pipeline. Um, in my case, when I joined Frontier, I wasn't really comfortable with baking at all. So uh, my lead would push me with like uh, bigger and bigger props and push me into how to bake them too. Like they, they would start with like really simple stuff and then they would go to more elaborate stuff that was like more intricate. 
Right. But it really taught me how to bake and how to get like a good normal map from like a high poly to low poly. Mm -hmm. And then um, after a while, like as an intermediate, you take more charge of the thing that you're responsible for and you're more um, independent instead of always relying on uh, a lead or a senior giving you feedback. Like the feedback is still going to be there, but it's going to be less. Like you're going to be more independent of the stuff that is happening around you. So yeah. Gonna... So I think yeah. Go on. Yeah. So I mean, that's kind of because because I'm I'm still a junior right now, but I think I have like two and a half years of experience now. So that means I'm I'm kind of going into the direction of becoming a, a an intermediate. Yeah. Um, and I would say like that's that's what I've been told a lot at my previous job and also here is that the job i'm doing or that the juniors are doing is often the same thing that regulars are doing mm -hmm. like the exact same task but you just have more opportunities to to ask questions to to like you you and you're like you said you're you're less independent maybe um, and timelines might be a little bit more lenient too yeah could that that's true that could be a, a thing as well and you don't have other responsibilities, right? Yeah. That, I think that's a big thing. Like, you're just doing your job and that's it. You don't have to, like, help with recruiting or, like, I don't know, what else could, could you do on the side? Like, um, you have a lot less, like, meetings to go to and, 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 and planning stuff. You're just doing your, your job. So I would say, it, in some cases, the longer you're in the, in the industry, you actually might be doing less of your of the job that you yeah. started with, right? Because you're going to become more of a almost like a managerial position. Yeah, yeah, point. yeah. I definitely agree. Um, so, so this is where my personal experience as like currently an intermediate with uh, almost six years of experience and moving my way up the ladder too, going going towards senior. Um, currently what i'm responsible for is i have been involved with uh recruitment for a little mm -hmm. bit too and um yeah there, there are some other responsibilities that that come into play especially like a, still a large majority of my time is spent on working in the level right but it's like you said like there's there's like more meetings coming in and there's like uh yeah more managerial stuff coming in and also like there's there's like some responsibilities where i get the opportunity to um have a little say with art direction at this point too yeah. not like make the big decisions but like at least have a voice in the conversation right yeah so yeah you're absolutely right like at some point you're you're gonna uh pivot more and more towards like more managing management stuff yeah, and then and then there comes a time where there is even more of a split, right? When it comes to like either becoming more of a lead person or like a principal artist, mm -hmm. and that's like the the big thing, right? Because you're either choosing pretty much a, a managerial position that just requires knowledge of art, but you don't actually have to do a lot of art yourself, mm -hmm. which is a, a lead artist, or something that's a principal artist. That's just like the genius guy that everyone respects for being amazing at their thing, but they just sit in a corner and just pump out amazing art all day, right? Yeah. Like that's and at least what 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 a principal artist is in my in my uh, experience. <laughs> <laughs> He's just the amazing guy that sits in the corner of the office. Ah, oh, oh, we had a <laughs> we we had a character artist at my previous studio. It was just like it was like the 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 guy who everyone went to for for questions and stuff. yeah yeah was yeah crazy. i was about to say that is probably the the biggest the biggest thing is like whenever you have questions do you, you just go to that guy because yeah he's just a he or she is just a fountain of knowledge right and uh i would also say that they're probably involved with um creating the pipelines or like at yes. least managing some some part of the pipeline where it's like look like um we can we can optimize this section of the pipeline here he will probably have like a big responsibility of that too fair yeah because they they have they just have the most experience right they're the ones who who know what 
what the best way to do things is. Yeah, yeah. They have more insight, and then, and then again, that that comes with the collaboration. Then maybe with technical artists and uh, all that stuff. Yeah, for programmers. sure. Programmers. Yeah, that is that is a good way of uh, of splitting it up because I don't think a lot of people and I don't think a lot of studios even have this uh, this split at some point. Because before it was always just like junior, uh, intermediate, senior, lead, and then I don't know art direction above it. Like it was just one path that you could take. But now, right. after a while, like a lot of people started realizing that the move up to senior or lead was just like I don't know. I just want to keep focusing on my stuff, right? Or like actually building the props or the levels or whatever. So I think a lot of a lot of studios have been, uh, well, especially the ones that have like large open worlds that they work on. Um, they have like this split built in, where they recognize that not all people might be suited for like a managerial job. Exactly. Yeah. And they just want to focus on their art. And that's and that's a weird thing, right? Because because um, you want. When a person has a lot of experience doing something, like let's just say props, mm -hmm. then it would make sense to just have have them make props, right? But at the same time, you could also have other people make the props, and then this experienced person is the one that that's telling them how to do it, right? So then you lose that person making the props, but you gain a lot of people that are learning from the person. So that's that's the thing, right? And mm -hmm. And like you said, some people are just are more hands on and they're like, yeah, I just want to do this myself. And some people are more like maybe, maybe even because then at this point, you're probably going to uh, uh, like you're, you were probably in the industry for like 20 years already or 10 or 15, whatever. And then you might say, oh, yeah, actually, I don't want to do props anymore. You know, I, I did mm -hmm. this for the last 15 years. Now I just want to be the guy who manages people doing props. Right? Yeah. Or give, he was giving feedback. Who's using his expertise and his um, his experience to to show other people how to be better, or even move to something like an art direction perspective. Like, yeah, exactly. I think that's a that's a big factor of it too. It's just the age and the longevity within the industry, because I think it's it's natural for people that, like you said, like do do props for like 10, 15 years. They there is a point in your life when you're just like, oh, maybe there's something more to this. Maybe I can, I can, uh, I don't know, help help other people out by training them or like mentoring them. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think I think that's where you see the the variation come in too. Yeah. However, there are people that are just like super specific on what they love to do, and yeah, yeah they're just hyper focused on that too. That's the thing. That's why it's we can talk all we want, but of course, it's always going to be an individual thing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. Nothing, nothing people. is uh is black and white Sense in this. Them, yeah. Because like location, uh, location studios, like uh, other other structures of working, like they could, they could all have like uh, different perspectives on it. I know, I know some indie companies are uh, moving away from having job titles at all. So oh, they just wow. have like, look, you're just, you're just an employee. Right. And then you obviously, you still have specializations, but yeah, I don't, I don't know the specifics of it, but I'm just trying to get away from like the putting you in a box basically. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think that actually ties in perfectly to uh, our question this week, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So this is kind of cheating. Because this is this is a question that uh, I came up with myself, so it's a uh, it's a Patreon question by by Timothy, <laughs> and it's um shout out, to the yeah, team. shout out to myself, great. <laughs> um, but it's it's about the generalization or the limitations that you put onto yourself. So, uh, great question. I, I just by the way. yeah yeah I'm really good at writing questions, right? <laughs> So, how do skills of a generalist compare to the artists who are hyper-focused? 
Yeah. Because, um, yeah, I always think about this myself, where I tend to be an artist that loves to focus on like a lot of stuff. Like I love every aspect of environment art creation, where I mm-hmm. I do my own VFX, I do my own tech, the own materials, the own shaders, blah blah blah. Like I I like to do everything, and I was just wondering from your perspective how this compares to uh, a person like me who loves to do everything or uh, a person that is hyper focused on their skills. Like, is there uh, is there a good and bad thing about it? What do you think? So, um, I mean, like I said previously, right? I uh, I love doing props. It's my favorite thing, um, probably. But I, I like having that balance of doing other stuff as well. And when I'm working on, on my personal stuff, I'm not just doing props, like single props. I'm doing full environments. And I'm also trying out stuff like doing foliage and, uh, and VFX and things like, things like that, just because I, I also want to learn more stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it definitely makes sense um, to put your arms, put your, what is it, put your feelers out, you know, seeing what's, kind of just seeing what's out there and trying to learn different things yeah um because it also makes you understand other like what other people are doing so it it makes it so you the way you work you can make their jobs easier right so if you work on a prop that's going to be animated and you have had some experience with animation you kind of know i have to do this like this so the animator is going to have a better time Mm -hmm. right or yeah whatever um and so i think there's definitely value in that um but that is just general what, knowledge right because yeah, that, that could, is yeah. that is not like generalizing yourself where up until a point you're as good in uh rigging or animation as you oh, are yeah. in environment art oh yeah no no yeah, yeah i'm talking i'm just talking about like just knowledge in general yeah but um i'd say it really depends on your working environment as well. Because in a big studio, if there's going to be thousands of people working there or hundreds, um, you're probably going to be a lot more specialized mm-hmm. than than anywhere else. Because you have this department that only does this part and then this department who just, they all focus on one specific area. Yeah. But in in a smaller studio you're going to have to wear a lot more hats, right? You're going to be not just the environment artist, but also the character artist and the texture artist and the, I don't know, the rigger as well. So yeah. um, I think it really depends on where you want to go. Like we we always heard uh, at our uni that uh, people don't want a Swiss army knife. Yeah. Like... But I think some people like it's, it, it could make sense to be a Swiss Army knife if you know you want to like work on something that's a little bit more indie. Um, like it can it can make sense to be able to do more things. Mm-hmm. But if you, I would say, if you want to end up in in the triple A or like double A, whatever, like bigger bigger studios, it probably makes sense to focus at least on one umbrella, right? Yeah. <laughs> So if have, we say have that one have one skill that really stands out compared to all the other ones. Yeah. So let's just say if you're going to do if you're not sure if you want to do level art or prop art, that's fine because it's at least it's both environment art mm-hmm. under the environment art umbrella. Um or if you're like, ah, oh, I like rigging, but I also like doing characters, but I also like doing animation, then okay, that's maybe still all right, because you know it's it's it all kind of comes together so you can work somewhere and maybe like we said develop into a role that's more specific in the end yeah but if you're like ah oh, i like characters but i also like making environments but i really like uh, scripting as well yeah then and throw concept you... art in there too yeah yeah and just throw, yeah cuz <laughs> why not um then it might be um it might be worth it to focus on one of these things yeah like or or find something if if there is something like that that can kind of combine it right because maybe if you like scripting but you also like characters and environments then maybe you can be like a technical artist uh, that can write scripts for the environment and character artists to make mm-hmm. their life easier right i don't know yeah uh but yeah man i yeah, agree it's... like um i would i would definitely say like like you said focus on the on the umbrellas uh because 
if we if we're gonna take gonna go back to just a hyper focused environment like artist in general like if i'm looking at freelance you have the really good ones mm -hmm. which are like the top of the hill and then you have like a lot more people that are that are down on the other sections of the hill who are more generalized but like the, the right. people that you know or that you know the work of they tend to be like super specialized like uh vitali bulgarov i don't know if you know him just like a, a hard, hard service do. uh designer and he's just like yeah he's known for that stuff like he doesn't do anything else um at least at least he doesn't show anything else but that is like yeah people oh, look yeah. up yeah, to yeah of him. course i know him. yeah people look up to him but it's it's because he's like hyper focused and i wonder if we know people that are super generalized that stand out because i can't really think of an example at the moment um i just know that there's this guy on um... I never remember what his first name is. It's either Michael or just Mikal Kubas. I haven't heard yeah, about him. Yeah, it's Mikal Kubas, and he's um, so he makes he, he like he made a bunch of guns and hard surface stuff, and right now he's working on um a really amazing uh, procedural generation of uh of medieval houses. So he's doing like oh some, yeah 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 yeah, and I don't know I wouldn't say he's like a generalist just because he does two different things one that's more that that was just guns and one that's just like environment and technical stuff yeah he but just pivoted at some point I think yeah exactly but I just wanted to shout him out because he's a fucking amazing artist man yeah 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 his stuff is but amazing. yeah I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's like a person on our station that's like super famous because they do all the different things I don't yeah well yeah that's you also have to take that with a grain of salt right like being famous quote unquote <laughs> uh, famous. yeah 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 but I mean, uh just like being like that that people know your name yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in the in this particular circle is what i'm saying mm -hmm. no no i get it but uh yeah that that always makes me think but um if we take it back to like the studio environment i think from what i can see is that <sighs> There, there was also always this big push of, like you said, like the studios don't like a, a Swiss army knife. But I think that is kind of fading. Yeah. Because I tend to be more uh, generalized myself. Like I have an interest in level design and all that stuff too. And I, and I spend some time on it, working on it too. And that has been like a really big plus point of just talking to level design where I did like a... Yeah, maybe maybe that might be just uh, not really generalist, but more like the interest in different disciplines that comes into play. Yeah, I don't know. It gets kind of gray at that point, right? It goes into like a gray area. Yeah, um, it's that's the thing. It's so hard to define, right? Mm -hmm. Because like I'm, I'm still like an is. environment artist. Like that is my main focus. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's like you said, it's a big umbrella. Yeah. Yeah, it's so hard to define what a generalist is, right? Because that's kind of the whole thing. They do everything, yeah, but everything of what? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the thing. It's it's so if you if you want to say you're an you're a generalist, it's I think there's definitely a a, a place for that. But yeah, for sure. I I'd say yeah, it probably makes sense to not be like completely all over the place. Mm -hmm. I would even say that there's probably a place for everyone at any point is just finding it is a really tricky part yeah because say like you're super super generalized and you can do a lot of stuff like there's gonna be a studio or like a person looking out for that kind of person um, probably right yeah at some point but it's like yeah you just have to line up and be yeah be kind of known and like get to know that person and then just hit it off mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. This is this is like a, a good subject for thought. Like, I wasn't really expecting us to go that uh, that meta on this, but it makes me think about a lot of other things too. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, man, I I really hope that answers your question, Timothy. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh man, 
this this is we're going down a rabbit hole yeah this is uh yeah this is good <laughs> all right no but this this was a good talk personality. like uh yeah I, I enjoyed it like there was uh there was a lot of good stuff in it and yeah I, I hope and I, I... yeah go ahead no i just hope that it makes it makes it just a little bit clearer to people what uh what we do and what you might do if you want to become an environment artist in mm -hmm. the future so or if you already are then maybe it's it's still a good reminder of what you should be doing <laughs> yeah <laughs> i would say i would say one takeaway from this is um look at all the available options do a little bit of research but keep doing what you love yep because that, that's really important uh don't just do stuff because uh, you think it's what people want because then you have an, an you have a portfolio full of something you don't like doing and that's what people are going to hire you for so you'll end up doing something that you don't like doing which yeah. uh is not great yeah that that would suck yeah that's why i think it's so important to to have personal projects that that reflect what you want to do in your job mhm mm yeah Just, for sure uh, i 100% agree man yeah cuz that's yeah that's the thing that's what they're going to hire you for yeah. If you wanna, if you wanna become a character artist, but you think you have to do uh, guns, because uh, for some reason, then and you're gonna get hired to make guns, but you're like, oh, but I just wanted to make characters. Mm -hmm. that, that's, uh, so, yeah, just do what you love, people. Yeah, that's what. A, what a nice note to end on, you know. Yeah, exactly. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. Yeah, thank you, guys and girls. Catch you in the next one. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. If you did, then you can check out the playlist on the right for more episodes. And don't forget to like, subscribe or share with friends. If you're an environment artist trying to break into the industry or just looking to grow your skills, you can find a ton more resources like weekly tips, blog posts and more on beyondextend.com. But that's going to do it from our side, thanks so much for joining us, and a shout out to all of our Patreon supporters who made this possible.